So let's launch into the uh, notes. So now we're starting uh, into uh, notes 14. And uh, right here, you can see just how old this stuff is. But, um, um, you know, um, seismic imaging, um, if, uh, um, and, and I think, uh, I think this, this could well happen no matter who's elected, but you have Romney going around saying that uh, we need to press for North American energy independence. And um, the most difficult part of that is to, uh, is to get uh, uh, a secure supply of oil within North America. And for the first time in 60 years, that's actually going to be possible. It may happen in five years, no matter who's president. Okay. There's no way to stop it. Okay. I mean, oil is so valuable now that, um, uh, and it and it's it's going to you know the price of oil is not going to drop the way the price of gas will, because it's hard to it's much harder to have an oversupply of oil than gas. All right. Um, so uh, uh, seismic imaging is is really instrumental in in guiding the. Uh, uh, the horizontal drilling and the fracking uh, uh, operations. Um, I, I mean, that's you know, those are the uh, uh, the horizontal drilling and fracking. That's that's the transformative technology that is going to bring us um, North American oil security. Okay, we won't have to import any oil. Um, I, I predict in five years, and, and if you look at the trends, I'm sure it's going that way. And Tyler will be part of it. Tyler will be part of it, probably. Um, we'll see. Um, and I hope you're well rewarded for your for your efforts. Um, but uh, uh, you know, while while um, uh, seismic imaging was really a transformative technology for deep water oil and gas, okay. Uh, it, it just you know that wasn't going to happen at all without uh, without seismic imaging, okay. Um, but seismic Im imaging is really uh, uh, it's it is a crucial enabling technology, supporting technology for uh, horizontal drilling and fracking, okay. Um, it's it's what's allowing it to be, you know, economically applied all over the North American continent. Um, so uh, we uh, um, we're going to have this uh, you know kind of millennial development um, of uh, of North America's oil supply um, happening in the next few years because of seismic imaging. Okay, so I think you know people should learn about seismic imaging um, in kindergarten, and maybe eighty eight is before you were in kindergarten, but um, uh, I really think that uh, um, the uh, the age of these notes is uh, um, you know they're they're not they're actually the subject matter and maybe even a lot of the stuff that I have you know in these old notes it's um, it's not outdated it's in fact the linchpin of our of our uh, energy security right now. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to apologize for the for how old they are. They're too fundamental. They're too important. All right. So um, uh, again, you know, back to basics. All right. Uh, we'll we'll do we'll do some arm waving first before we get into the you know back into the equations. All right. Let's consider a geological process operating out of sight below the surface. All right. And uh, you know, I did a lot of early work on. Um, you know what we're now calling continental architecture. You know what's what's the history? What's the structure? You know how did pieces of the North American continent develop? Um, you know what is the structure through the crust? What's the structure of the lithosphere? Uh, I've I've done quite a bit of work in that area. All right, and um, of course a uh, this geological process that's operating out of sight can produce a mineral resource. And we're seeing seismic imaging, you know, today being applied to gold, to gas, to oil, to geothermal, um, yeah. And some of the ideas even are applied in uh, geotechnical engineering, which 
uh, for instance, I've gotten um, royalties from my um, uh, refraction microtremor development when a, um, a geotechnical company has bought a license for the Remy software to be able to go out and um, you know plan foundations for uh, wind towers and and foundations for the pedestals that the that the solar uh, arrays uh, sit on, you know, and if that if the foundation is is not properly planned, then you know, and the pedestal leans by one degree, then the whole thing's off. You know, it's all uh, it's all a big problem. Um, and if you have uh, wind towers that uh, are you know they're vibrating with such force that they um, um, you know that they could easily cause failure of the uh, of the soil uh, around their foundations if they're not properly done. So uh, you know some of the ideas in here, um, like the slant stack that you'll hear about, um, have uh, have also have been a help across every uh, every energy and mineral sector. Okay. All right. So so again, considering mineral resources and and. For the moment, consider geothermal to be a uh, a mineral resource. You know, hot brine, basically a uh, a mineral. Um, well, not technically, but but very much like a mineral resource. All right, what what information um, is going to help you characterize it? And so I've talked a lot about geometric form. We've talked about the the crater versus salt dome example and how just the pure geometry uh, can help you. All right, and um, you know, if you're going to horizontally drill into uh, into a shale formation and frack it first, you got to know you got to know where that where that shale is, and you want to you want to go in the straight. I, I don't know exactly what you do, but I, I would think the first assumption would be you're going to go in the straight and narrow right down the middle of the shale layer. Okay, um, and so you got to be able to follow it. You got to know where it is. Okay, you got to know where its upper and lower boundaries are. You got to know if it's faulted away. Okay, geometric form. There's also, of course, lithology. Okay, you want to be able to distinguish the shales from the sands. Uh, you know, first of all, okay, and um, and that's very lithology is extremely helpful, uh, but at least for what we'll cover in this class, it's uh, we can get a lot more information about geometry than we can about lithology. All right. So so you know, geometric info alone. Has worked and it is still working for the oil industry. And geometric info alone is helpful. It's not everything we need, but by any means, but it's it's helpful in the deep crust for continental architecture as well. I mean, really, you look at the sum total of all of the results that have come out of the Earthscope, um, uh, the NSF-funded Earthscope um, U.S. Array. Okay. And it's all about geometry. You know, where are the low velocities? Where are the high velocities? Where are the the uh, uh, the interfaces that convert waves in in the um, um, uh, that convert waves in the uh, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, the receiver function analysis. Okay, these are the the main results on continental architecture that that this you know this is this is the largest. Um, the largest NSF project ever in solid earth science. Their scope is a two hundred million dollar uh, enterprise over over ten years, and uh, so that's you know that's like uh, um, it's not like the physicists getting a super collider, but it's a lot like the oceanographers getting a ship or uh, or the uh, uh, there 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 are some there are some uh, satellites you know the uh, radio astronomers getting a satellite or something like that. Two hundred million dollars. Um, so you know we'd better produce some good results from Earthscope. Okay. So um, uh, you know we get that geometry with the seismic reflection surveys. Okay, that's what has has worked. Okay, I'm skipping over a lot of the uh, a lot of the examples because we've been t we've been talking about that in the last uh, week. So let's go ahead and. Try to reduce the complexity of our physics to a manageable level. All right, and um, so we're going to have two D experiments. Okay, um, we're going to have constant velocity. Okay, 
so here I'm showing you a cross section, and here's the axes that tell you what what I'm what I'm looking at. Okay, x and z, and um, here's a uh, 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 here's a, 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 a reflector. Okay, and the reflector is really part of a whole section, a whole distribution of reflectivities R, which is a, a cross section in X and Z. Okay, so R is the reflectivity. All right, and we that reflectivity in this particular cross section is representing one reflector that has this curved structure. So we put a source of seismic energy at the star. Uh, you know, one of you uh, hitting a hammer onto a steel plate, or um, one of the uh, thousand-pound explosions they did in to, in uh, um, uh, in the uh, Salton Sea project, uh, both on land and by throwing uh, uh, big uh, wads of explosives off the boat in, into Salton Sea. Uh, quite an amazing opportunity, actually, because you didn't have to worry about killing any whales or seals. Uh, in the Salton Sea, so they could do things there that you can't do in the open ocean. Okay, um, yeah, I, I heard a proposal once about uh, uh, dumping off uh, off a ship that goes between New Zealand and Antarctica, dumping off, you know, some uh, uh, you know half a megaton of, of TNT and letting it all go off at once because there's a spot along that ship track which is at the uh, um, the antipode of uh, some big array, okay, the, maybe the Norsar array, okay. So it would have been a very interesting uh, antipodal uh, experiment. Um, but you know, you can't. No more uh, can you let off. Uh, um, can you let off? A, you know, a whole. You know, huge amounts of explosives in the ocean because the, uh, you know, Greenpeace will be at your door and they'll have they'll have picketers on your, you know, at your university and. In, in days, okay, so uh, you can't do it. Um, so that source, uh, you know, is is actually radiating seismic energy in all directions, okay. But we can trace the paths through this constant velocity medium, okay, uh, to each of these receivers, okay, and um, and and as it should, it it it. This ray of, of you know which is basically following one little packet of seismic energy, okay. This ray is is going down to the reflector. It's uh, it's experiencing uh, you know equal angle of incidence to reflection, and it's the one that goes back up to the uh, to the receiver. All right. And as you are looking at further and further receivers, right, you're you're looking at you know larger angles and as well as different reflection points. Um, the uh, uh, the idea of the two D experiment is um, um, is based on an assumption of uh, you know why could a two D experiment ever approximate our three D experiments? All right, it's based on an assumption of cylindrical symmetry. Okay, basically two D the our two D math can represent our real three D world pretty well when we have this. So-called cylindrical symmetry. What does that mean? That we um, we are in an area where the strike of all the structure is basically in one direction, and we do a two D experiment in you know in a line that crosses that uh, that is a ninety degree uh, orientation to that to that strike. Okay, so we're you know it's a cross strike experiment. We're we're always putting the the uh, uh, we're running all the geophysics in the dip direction, okay, and and for the seismic especially that that can work very well. So uh, you know if you're if you're at the margin of a uh, you know you 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 go uh, northeast of the Walker Lane you're in the margin of one of these you know beautiful uh, uh, north south trending valleys in uh, in the middle of Nevada. Right, you're going to run east-west surveys because that's going to be, you know, those 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 long valleys, you know, like Big Smoky Valley, um, you know, they really do work quite well uh, uh, with this cylindrical symmetry. They're very, uh, you know, long and narrow, and that's perfect. Okay, 
So, uh, you know, a lot of assumptions here, but maybe ones that are not, you know, yeah, we, we're, there's very few cases where we can really deal with, you know, we can really accept this constant velocity assumption, but, um, you know, we, we're going to have to work pretty hard to get beyond it. So let's, let's first start with it and see how far we can get. Okay. So, and, and uh, the other thing is about, uh, you know, what are the, what, what, what are the physical parameters of the of the medium? Okay, now we're just concerned about you know P wave seismics here, uh, and in fact acoustic seismics. We're going to make everything fit to the acoustic wave equation. So we're going to assume that there is only one velocity, okay, and it's constant, all right, and that's going to be the P wave velocity, and and that's that's half of the medium parameters. The only other the only other medium parameter is this reflectivity, okay. And and I'll have a discussion later with you about about you know what what can produce reflectivity in the in the presence of constant velocity, and and then what do we really have in the Earth you know that looks like this, okay, but especially for uh, marine surveys and and you know lake bed chirp like like Amy Ice's uh, thesis and what Gretchen's working on right now, um, it's it's pretty good. You know, it's not bad at all. All right. Now, for you know, for surveying over a geothermal uh, resource, uh, you know, like Astor Pass, you know, on land, it's terrible. You know, this is uh, you can explain, you know, maybe five percent of the energy in the data with with this model. All right. But for the chirp survey, you've got like ninety-five percent of the amplitude in the data comes. You could you could explain is coming from these very simple media parameters, constant velocity, and a reflectivity section. Uh, and I want you to think of the reflectivity se section, which is you know, r of x and z. Uh, it's a function which is, which is mostly 0. You know, in most of the cross-section, it's 0, you know, because there aren't discontinuities everywhere. All right? So we're not talking about fractal geology here, okay? which is another way you know, that I've gone way beyond this. All right? um, there's, you know, we have a limited number of discontinuities. You know, there's only so many reflectors in the section, at least so many that we we care about. Okay, and those are the ones that we're going to mark. You know, it's it's as if, uh, you know, um, uh, I told Tyler, look, uh, okay, we've got we've got the uh, the mudstone at at Soda Lake, we've got the top of the basalt, and and maybe you know find a couple of other. Uh, reflectors, you know, in your section that, that seem to generate, you know, high amplitudes consistently, but that's it. Okay, Every, the the reflectivity section is zero, except it's the reflection coefficient uh, at those four uh, interfaces, and that's it. Very simple. Okay, but notice that that the reflectivity section is allowed to take it is allowed to take any you know any value anywhere in the section. Okay. Um, well, any value that's a reasonable reflection coefficient, which can be negative, of course. Um, so, so you can have any dip, you know, any complicated geometry of those, um, of those, of those interfaces. Okay, and so, you know, uh, maybe Tyler is is focused around just one reflector. Okay, which which has you know which appears. At each place, it only appears once. Okay, each location it appears at some depth, but that depth map, you know, can do anything. All right, and that's where you're getting your information about about tectonics because you can put faults in it. You know, you can have very steep faults. You can, um, uh, you know, you can have dips. You can have curvature of that reflector. You know, that's that's what you're trying to map out. Okay, so so for that problem in in Tyler's thesis, you know, this. This uh, uh, this could also work. Uh, we're, we can't so easily use constant velocity, but this simple reflectivity function, reflectivity section, will work too. Okay. Um, another thing that that we're assuming is that our receivers, and, and here this is really applicable mostly to uh, hydrophones. Um, you know, not even so much to the chirp fish and its uh, its receiver geometry. But there's no directional tuning. Our our receivers are 
are, sensitive, are equally sensitive to waves coming from every direction. Okay? And that, you know, classic hydrophones, that's true. But once we start to, you know, make our, our sources and receivers into arrays, well, the reason we have arrays is to, re is to directionally tune and not see, you know, waves that are propagating horizontally by our, uh, um, by our, our, our receiver array. We want to get those waves that are coming up from, as reflections from deep and hitting flat onto our, our receiver array. All right, so... But we're going to ignore that issue for uh, uh, quite a while here. Okay, now, uh, so in general, you know, we can make these assumptions if we uh, if we think about having primary subcritical reflections only. Okay, we're going to ignore multiples. We're going to ignore surface waves. We're going to ignore direct waves. You know, which we're in all these things that that I, all these examples I've shown you, even in the synthetics. We're going to ignore converted phases, you know, P to S, S to P, um, P to R, you know, Rayleigh, Rayleigh to S. You know, that all happens, but uh, uh, but we're going to ignore it, okay? And and uh, what that means is that you know traditionally we've tried to process those out of the data records and just leave the refract the reflections, okay? So you know, there's 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 a huge literature on how to do this. You know, uh, to take your your dirty, noisy, um, you know, land data and get rid of all those converted phases and all the all the surface waves and everything else except the P wave reflections. Okay, a lot of a lot of work, uh, a lot of energy expended on on doing that. And then also we have an acoustic medium, so that's why our assumptions work so well in lakes and seas. Okay, because it's you know in that fluid bottom, you know, fluid saturated muddy bottom of the lake it's still a fluid it's still an acoustic medium okay uh, but uh, you know as long as we we don't have um, <clears throat> you know even for our land surveys um, if we don't have too much heterogeneity to convert uh, too much energy to s waves and surface waves then it actually can work uh, you know the p waves that we can filter out of our data and and you know filter, do filtering of our data to emphasize those P waves, um, it kind of works um, as long as there's not too much heterogeneity, too much conversion of P wave energy to S wave energy. Um, now, these assumptions and these situations work out really well together. Uh, if, if, you know, if all we're trying to do is find subsurface geometry and, and relative subsurface geometry, um, we're in great shape. You know, we can we can push on those assumptions and 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 apply the assumptions in areas that, that, that we have no business applying them in, and things can still work out. Okay, uh, we can find out enough. We can get a good enough image. The image will be accurate enough. Okay, um, but if we're worried about getting uh, more than geometry, if we want to get uh, lithology, okay, then these these assumptions are 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 a disaster. Okay, we got to go to you know full waveform, uh, full elastic, you know full heterogeneity. Um, you know we're we're gonna we we got to not only um, accept the surface waves, we got to make use of them. You know, and and take that whole wave field, and and use it all. Okay, that's you know and and that's called seismic inversion. Um, you know, looking at at the whole messy wave field and being able to explain it physically. And we can do that now. We can model the whole dirty wave field, okay? Uh, and I can show you that that you know you can you can have a terrible looking record, um, you know, just shot through with all kinds of confusing phases, uh, and um, and and yet you know um, every one of those is is some kind of identifiable wave, okay? And so learning to deal with that is, is, is something that's advanced a lot in the last uh, 20 years. Okay. So, so, you know, this whole half of the class, if, if, if really you're just interested in lithology, uh, it's not going to be much good. Okay. You got to, you got to go to that advanced, you know, wave field, uh, tomography and inversion, um, approach. Okay. Um, but, but actually, um, this half of the class will do you some good, along with the last, with, along with the first half of the class. It'll do you some good 
because actually it turns out that we we start our full wave field inversions actually with migration. Migration is a part. It's like step zero. Okay, it's how you it's how you get out. You know, that's how you pass go. Is you start with a migration. Okay, and then you do a lot more. But but you got to start with what I'm going to teach you right now. Okay. Um, so so here's a, an example of a, of a data data set that that looks ter terribly terrifyingly noisy. Okay. Um, but uh, the uh, the thing is, um, it's not noise. It's not white noise. It's not thermal noise. It's not wind noise. It's all it's all of the the apparent noise in this data set is is real waves from something. It's just you know it doesn't mo much of it doesn't uh, doesn't fit the um, the assumptions of of uh, uh, you know primary P wave reflections, um, uh, but actually much of it does. And so the 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 apparent you know what we what we think of as noise in this data set, and maybe tr a traditional view of noise you know would have thought of most of this data set as just noise. Okay, uh, what we thought of as noise is is really information. It's just you know, it's com it's complex, and it's it's representing the complexity of the uh, of the crust. Okay, so so you know, our seismic data set, as we've learned, is a is the product of a filtering process. We have a source. Okay, and we um, uh, we pass it through the earth filter, which you know now we can start thinking of as this reflectivity section in X and Z, and we get data as the as the output. All right, and and if we add wind noise to the data, right, that comes after this convolution. Uh, if we add thermal noise to the data, you know, it's all it's all just added to the output, okay. And it would be uh, it would be uncorrelated in time, okay. So uh, you know we have um, uh, the source uh, convolved with the uh, reflectivity section, you know, which somehow I'm I'm. I'm able to convolve it after I somehow reduce it to uh, to a time series, and then we add. You know, this, we just have additive noise, and that gives us our data series. Okay, uh, and you know, the classic thing is that uh, and is random noise is not reproducible over time. All right, but here's a survey from 1962, uh, which is just barely after I was born, so it's a long time ago. Um, and uh, my fir actually one of the first projects I did uh, at Caltech when I was a grad student there was I uh, recovered this data off the magnetic drums and and put it in uh, essentially in the SegWi format uh, so I could actually uh, I, I I couldn't even plot it until I did that um, so and we actually uh, had to use the the magnetic drum recorder from you know from the late fifties to to do that and they they still had it in their junk room you know. And it still worked, which was really amazing. So um, here's uh, here's that section, um, and it's uh, really two arrays, and they intersect. And there are at this intersection there are two traces, okay, um, and they're in the same place, but they were shot on different days, okay. So so the middle trace here, you can see it's it's a double trace, shot at different days at the same location, same shot location, okay. And you can see that that most of it is perfectly coherent from one day to the next. It's correlated over time and actually correlated very well. Okay, you know maybe maybe five or ten percent of it is uncorrelated with with time. Okay, so what this means is that um, you know since the reflectivity section is constant over time, it's also got to be complex. All right. So now we can still allow that, and I'll talk to you about how, how we can allow that. All right. Good. So we are looking at a data set. Um, it's a seismic reflection data set recorded in like 1966 in the Mojave Desert of Southern California. And it was one of the earlier experiments to look and see how, how deep the seismic reflection technique could be used. And so uh, here we see reflections um, 
you know, apparently coherent from trace to trace over this relatively small array, um, which is three kilometers long in total, and in, in two different directions, uh, meeting at the, the thick black line in the, in, on the middle left. So um, I guess it was 1965 he did the experiments. Um, and he actually published them too in, uh, in geophysics way back when. And this, um, uh, we have here some apparently uh, laterally uh, continuous, um, laterally continuous um, reflections that uh, you know at least over those those small distances. Okay, um, and they're at uh, about ten seconds two-way travel time, which if you work it through. The maybe six to six point five um, average p velocity of the crust means that they're coming from about thirty five kilometers depth, which from early um, you know early experiments uh, done in Southern California with the with earthquakes in the Southern California array by uh, Richter and Gutenberg, okay, um, you know following only only really only. 10 or 20 years after Mohorovicic did his work in, uh, in Serbia, um, you know, 35 kilometers was the uh, thickness of the crust and the depth of the Moho transition. Uh, and there it is coming out as a uh, reflection or um, at least a set of reflections. There's obviously something going on here, you know, where at eight seconds uh, to 10 seconds, you have a sequence of reflectors and um, there's a there is a, a kind of a complex story that was only elucidated um, maybe uh, 40 years later uh, in in the uh, transverse ranges. This is uh, uh, on the northeastern side of the transverse ranges, really in the area that the Landers rupture went through in 1992. So it's been studied very well now. Uh, but this was a, a very early piece of work. Um, the main difficulty with getting reflections from deep in the crust at these frequencies, right? This is clearly, uh, I forget exactly, 25, 35 hertz reflections. So they have, uh, you know, wavelengths and resolutions on the order of 100 to uh, 250 meters. And the the main difficulty is just getting energy down there. And so. Um, it was easy to drill into the dry lake bed of this so-called soggy lake, and um, uh, so that was the uh, um, the the facility that that enabled uh, um, Hewitt Dix and, and a crew of students to uh, drill in some uh, some shots and and actually get these Moho reflections. Um, I don't anticipate that I will ever be able to record Moho reflections from um, uh, from uh, either a, a small hammer or or a uh, or a sledgehammer, but um, uh, with uh, with even a, a mini vibrator, uh, getting moho moho depths is possible. All right. Now, what's spectacular about this um, this record is is this fact that there isn't just one moho reflection and Maybe you know, 50 years ago, we would have called this a Conrad reflection, you know, between the the uh, felsic upper crust and the mafic lower crust. Uh, that's partly what it actually is in Southern California, but other things, you know, going all the way up, there are these um, um, there are lots and lots of reflectors. Okay, and Hewitt Dix's uh, observation here was since these Reflectors are repeated, okay, in time. They're stable in time. It's not uncorrelated noise, all right. And another piece of evidence that they are not uncorrelated noise is this fact that they are continuous from trace to trace. But you can even look in this, uh, you know, green boxed area here uh, at things that are apparently not that coherent, you know, from trace to trace. Maybe they appear on just two traces. All right. So then, looking at the close-up, okay, even the things that are, um, you know, not uh, uh, not very coherent from trace to trace, um, 
you know, here you can see the overlapping wiggle traces in that uh, in that area. They're still, you know, uh, it's it's maybe ten or twenty percent noise at most. Okay, ten or twenty point percent noise that doesn't correlate, and the great bulk of of everything, you know, really correlates remarkably well. You know, it's a different shot hole in the same place, but you know, maybe a few meters away. Different charge, different day. They they had to, you know, if you leave your uh, your your geophones on the ground, uh, then the uh, um, the little rats will come out at night and eat the cables, and so uh, you you know have to pick everything up and plant the geophones again. So it's not uh, um, uh, it's not uncorrelated with time. It's very well correlated with time, uh, really quite remarkably so. Um, and that was uh, one of my early uh, early projects when I was a, a grad student was showing this. Uh, some of this noise, some of the uh, mismatch, could be just from the uh, instrumentation. You know how I had to uh, recover the the uh, records from the magnetic uh, drum sheets and and digitize them again. Uh, well, or digitize them for the first time. Uh, so that's uh, you know that could be causing noise there. Um, so this proves what does this prove? This proves that there really is something in there. Every one of these little wiggles is something that's in the earth. Okay, there are very few of these wiggles that are not something. You know, maybe this one, you know, is completely uncorrelated in time. All right, but then right after it, there's this one, which appears here and here, and but by here, it's really it's something else. Okay, you know that is correlated in time. Uh, so what we have are are Things that that we would have thought, you know, we were after that that parsimonious, um, you know, reflector sequence, where we have a reflection at the moho, and maybe we'll accept, you know, that there's a structure down below the moho. Here's a structure in the middle in the middle of the lower crustal layer. There's a structure at the at the top of the lower crustal layer, the the so-called Conrad. We might be able to locate another couple of of you know very continuous structures in the upper crust. And then some in the uh, in the basins here, uh, you know, there's a reflection that's probably from or just below the bottom of the basin. But um, you know, our our this data set uh, and and many others just kind of blows away our concept that the that the reflective crust is simple. It's full of features, and so our challenge now is to be able to pull them out. Okay. And and you know we got to validate them. We got to figure out which are our multiple reflections, which are primary reflections, and then be able to locate them. So now our reflectivity section, instead of being relatively simple, um, is uh, and and uh, you know this is a cross section because I put the axes x and z here, and we do an experiment where we have these shot holes drilled into soggy dry lake, and we have. Receivers spread out some some miles away, and uh, you know maybe here's the uh, the moho uh, down here, and it's relatively continuous, but there's lots of other little little spots and and uh, uh, structure in here that uh, um, you know that we could learn about if if we could only you know figure out how to process this data set. So our, our crustal data, at least, are just full of, of things to look at, all right? And our reflectivity section, uh, you know, R of x and z, that's supposed to be a z there, um, is, uh, um, is not as simple as we want. But that means that, that just by being able to correctly geometrically locate each of these little reflectors, we'll get a lot of information about what those reflections could be. And I showed you earlier some examples of that. OK, so it's complex, but it still meets our, our assumptions, right? We have uh, you know, this reflectivity section is 0 you know, in a lot of places, and it's kind of spiky in others. You know, where we're on a reflecting interface, it's spiky. 
and the uh, the size of the spike, the height of the spike, is is um, proportional to the reflection coefficient. So it still meets our assumptions. We could still have pretty much a, a constant velocity view here. Okay, so we have you know hope even under these restrictive and simple assumptions of resolving some some interesting structure and, and learning some interesting things about geology here. Okay.